Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, roads and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long term, not just survive. The foundation of anything that you do should be, okay, I have this unique belief of the world, and I believe that I can create something that will help promulgate that belief, whatever the thing that is that you're going to do. And if you have a very clear vision and you can get people behind that vision, well, then that's a machine, right? And then you just need to figure out, okay, how am I going to monetize it? The monetizing for me, I, I believe, you know, becomes second, because if you have a vision and you have a vision that people can get behind, that means that people are, can get behind it. This is Josh Sharkey, founder and CEO at Miss, which is a recipe tool for professional shifts. It helps operators organize their costing, automate nutrition and allergen information, and give an online training option to help operators to ensure strong standards, productivity, and ultimately better profitability on the menus. Josh has a background as a train chef in high-end restaurants operating his own restaurants, as well as being the chief operating officer for a multi-brand restaurant operation in New York. And in this conversation, Josh shares his passion for building a culinary operating system that makes life easier for chefs and the kitchen. We talk about the adaption curve of technology in hospitality and just believes we just got started when it comes to putting great tech tools in the hands of our employees. We take a deep dive into the need to be a change in mindset around leadership to make sure we thrive and survive in the new era of hospitality and to overcome the staffing crisis. He also shares the books that has made a huge impact on him as an individual, leader and business person and why reading books are so essential for his growth. Before you tune in, please sign up for a weekly newsletter packed with more Maverick insights, strategies and tools. Find the links in the show notes or visit hospitalitymavericks.com. Please also download a free copy of From Fragile to Agile, a white paper done in cooperation with BizSimply. Find it at bizsimply.com under the resource tab or via the link in the show notes. We have some great insights and solutions for improving your leadership game. This episode will inspire you to push yourself and also get better at understanding the impact tech can have when it comes to improving profitability and productivity. So today we're going to be talking about uh, something that I haven't been talking about on the uh, the show before, and actually something that's very important because I always talk about uh, profitability and the importance of it. Of course, you need to have a purpose, but if you can't make profit, there's no business. And and when it comes to hospitality, you know, there's a, there's a lot of money running through your kitchen, and there's a lot of challenges in your kitchen now. And uh, Recently, I uh, met a, a person that has created a tool to help with that. Not only creating, you know, help with creating profitability in the kitchen, but also maybe get a bit of an overview so you make better leadership decisions in your kitchen. So it, it's it's a great honor to uh, have you on the show today, Joss, where we're going to be talking about tech, kitchens, hospitality, and you know, and your journey and what made you build a, a platform that can help both chefs and restaurant operators. Well, it's an honor to be here, Michael. So, um, so for people out there, can you give like a bit like a you know a elevator pitch of your your story of uh, and your journey of going from you know probably like many others starting uh, peeling the potatoes to now building tech for restaurants? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, you know, I was I was and I still consider myself you know a chef. I mean, this is what I did for most of my life um, for fifteen plus years, and then. Uh, you know, the upper echelon of fine dining in, in, in New York City and overseas so, so for some of the most incredible chefs in the world that were are what were and still are uh, some of the biggest inspirations for me. Uh, and then I became, you know, a restaurant owner and operator uh, in New York City as well. 
Um, and then throughout that time, you know, uh, and we can sort of get into the details of it, um, you know, slowly we're sort of realizing like, hey, there's this thing missing for us. Um, and, um, you know, after about eight years of running a number of restaurants that I, that I started in, in, in New York, I decided um, that I couldn't, I had to scratch this itch um, and I divested from, you know, from running the restaurants and focused fully on building this new product, which we're talking about today, which is Meats. What does uh, this platform do? Because it, it seems very simple what it does. It, it's, it's you would think, why? Why haven't anyone really saw thought about this before? I've seen similar thing, but not so specifically solving uh, the problems you are solving in the kitchens. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, and it is simple, and I think it's really you know it really took sort of you know the perfect scenario of. Uh, you know, I'm no like special chef in any way other than other than many other chefs. Um, I just happen to really um, have a deep love for systems as well as a love for for the kitchen and, and food. And um, and I think that the, that part was essential to be able to build a tool like me's. And really what we're doing is we're just centralizing the entire culinary development, training and production process. That's 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 what we do. Um, and the ultimate goal here is that we are creating the universal recipe meeting, right? So that, you know, if you are writing a recipe, if you are reading a recipe, if you're managing a recipe anywhere in any platform um, that should all live through the medium of me's that they can be distributed to other, to other places. The people that got this tool in their hands because you have been live for a couple of years and you, you went live uh, is, is early midst of the pandemic. I couldn't figure it out when I was doing a, a bit of a Googling, but it looks like you you just launched in the right period where everything suddenly in restaurants suddenly has become digital or digital suddenly leads in a way together with there's two things that drives your business, I say in the moment, technology and people. And it seems like you just landed in a sweet spot there. Was that on purpose or that was a bit by coincidence because you've been on a, a journey prior to that, I know. Uh, well, you know, I would be I would be lying if I said it was on purpose for sure. If anything, I was actually very trepidatious about launching. Um, you know, in the time that we launched, and we actually delayed the launch. Uh, so we, we launched in December of 2020, so about about a year ago. Um, we, the plan was actually to launch in um, May of that year, um, and uh, you know, obviously when 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 COVID hit, um, you know, I realized like, well, you know, I have responsibility to the industry to to do something to help. And, and although I do, like, I, I firmly believe that, you know, the, you know, that Mies is going to change the paradigm for how, you know, chefs and culinary professionals operate, um, that at the time, you know, there was more, um, a more direct thing that we need to do to help. So we actually launched this thing called Recipes for Relief prior to launching Mies in May of, uh, of last year, which is essentially, you know, we quickly built a public version, like a consumer version of the, of the, of the platform and allowed chefs to sell, create and sell their recipes and recipe books on me's and hundred percent of the proceeds went, went to the chefs. Um, so we did that for quite a while. I, I, I consciously did, you know, made the decision that, you know, we're, we're not going to be a consumer company, you know, anytime soon. So let's, you know, I, rather than buy African the company, I, 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 I decided to just focused on, 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 you know, on color professionals. And so we launched to the public in December of 2020. Um, so again, like a, about a year ago, and it's been, you know, really, really fast growth ever since. And I think the one thing I didn't predict, I always, you know, we, we've been building this product for long before we launched and we're building it within the ecosystem of the restaurants I was running as well as, you know, with a number of chefs in my network, you know, across the country you know, beta testing and making sure that we were building the right product. And so I was pretty confident that we had something really special. The one thing I didn't plan for because of the pandemic is this proliferation of, of, of like these prosumers uh, and, and, and chefs that were um, you know, starting their own businesses independently from restaurants, you know, just starting their own food businesses, whether it's a delivery business or a meal kit company or a, a food business, you know, themselves. And uh, it turns out Mies is perfect for that um, because we, you know, among all the things that you can do within me is obviously you can get really, really accurate food costs more, more so than probably any platform that exists uh, and nutrition analysis and things like that, all in a way that just is very easy to do. Um, and the platform is not expensive, you know, comparative to the sort of an ERP system or back office system that might be, you know, 300 bucks or something a month um, uh, with a lot of setup and, you know, individuals starting their own company, they're clearly not going to do that, may never do that. And so we were lucky in that there was this, proliferation of that that sort of you know uh, segment of, of 
of the world that just started building their own business, which is so cool. Um, you know, we just we're helping to empower all these all these individuals to, um, you, you know, to help them run their business. So when uh, you saw this quick adaption of this tool, because you're, you're, you're definitely solving a problem people have, what, what kind of things is this doing for people? How is this, you know, impacting their profitability? Do you know that? Have you looked into that as you, you rolled it out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have some really interesting metrics around how we're able to sort of reduce uh, food and labor costs significantly. Um, I always, you know, it's tough for me because I think about this as a tool for our craft first and then, you know, finance, secular finance is obviously really, really important. And I think that, you know, the way that, um, the way that Mies is most, um, effective is that it's actually impacting, um, the economics of your business, as opposed to a tool that will show you the economics of your business. I think that, you know, most people are building software, uh, so that you can see the best reports and, and, and see your theoretical food costs and see your, all these things which is imperative that, that that's very important. But, um, first of all, that information needs to be accurate. Um, and, uh, you need to be able to understand how can you impact it, right? How can you, um, how could you make more money and how can you save money? And that's what Mies does, right? So the output of, of the reporting and things like that, well, we, we, we don't, we don't do a ton of that. We actually connect with ERP systems and back office systems that, uh, and inventory systems that, that help with that. And we focus on how do we help, you know, you know, operators and business owners and chefs like have an impact on that number. Right. And so there's two, there's, well, I would say there's three ways in which we do that. Right. And, and the first one is, um, in order to get a really, really accurate food cost and nutrition as well, there's, there's so much data that's needed, uh, when you create a recipe, right. You have to know if I, you know, use a head of lettuce and I'm going to use a half a cup of shredded lettuce, you know, how much does that head of lettuce weigh because I'm buying by the head and how much do I lose when I take the core out and how much does that cup weigh when I use it in a recipe? And then all of that information for every single ingredient, you know, if I'm taking just the leaves off of mint, how much do I lose? All of that impacts your cost significantly. And if you don't have all that information, then your food cost won't be right. So first of all, we've built all of that into the system and we're constantly adding more, right? So we have chefs and teams that I've had, I've, I've had over the past five years, I've been building all this data into the system so that you don't have to do any of that work. We basically remove all that work for you. So all you do is you put in your recipe and then we'll make sure that the cost, you just put in how much you spend and we'll make sure that that cost is right. We'll make sure that the allergens are there. You don't have to do that. We'll make sure the nutrition is there. And so make it really easy to get the information in, make a beautiful platform that's easy to use so that they actually use it. Cause if you don't use it, it doesn't matter anyways. Right. And by doing both of those things, the output becomes that we then have tools to show you the levers that you can take to, you know, reduce the theoretical cost of a, of a recipe item or a menu item or of a menu. That's what matters, right? You know, I've run, you know, lots of restaurants and owned lots of restaurants and, you know, everything from restaurants that had a, you know, um, in, in annual revenue of a million dollars to restaurant groups that had $150 million in run rate. And what I can tell you is the problems are the same, right? Is that, you know, yes, we need to waste less, but ultimately if you can lower the theoretical food cost of your menu without affecting quality, uh, meaning like if your food cost right now, if you operated perfectly and wasted nothing was 28%. And on average, most people like waste about two points of a product, um, you know, then, okay, you have a 30% food cost and that's, and that's, you know, not great, but you know, that's, that's pretty average. Right. But if you can take that 28% and figure out all the ways in which to make that 25% to start with, well, even if you waste the same amount of product, um, you still have, you know, three more points, uh, you know, for the bottom line, which is anywhere from 30,000 to $300,000, you know, um, in savings just from, you know, you know, just from those, those actions. And so, um, we, 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 we allow sort of very direct impact on, on how you can not just save money, but prevent yourself from losing money, um, long-term. And so that's a big part of the product. The other part I would say is just, um, you know, recipes in, encompass so many, so many different sort of tentacles, right? You have, when you have a recipe, you have the cost of the recipe and you're the nutrition of the recipe and you have, you know, how do you make this recipe and where should this recipe live? And who should have access to the recipe? And how do you track the changes of this recipe? And how do you share this recipe? And how do you distribute the information from this recipe to other places? All that happens in, in, in many disparate, you know, systems right now. And so by centralizing it, we are, you know, reducing 
uh, significantly the amount of labor and, and time and people that it takes, you know, to manage all of this content. Um, and we make training just way easier, right? Like you're typically what happens with training is either there's, it's non-existent, or maybe you have an LMS system with like long videos, or maybe you have like printouts on a PDF. And in Mies, we sort of, we, we actually like, t like hired some training experts to help us understand how do you, how do people ingest information best, right? And it's typically not long videos. It's very short increments of information. And so we just built that into the product so that every single step of a recipe can have its own, you know, picture or video. And that becomes a slideshow that you can swipe through, like, you know, almost like Instagram, um, so that people can understand and pick up this information, you know, really quickly. So ultimately, you know, saving cost, you know, uh, saving, um, you know, both food cost and labor cost, and, and making sure that you're executing far more consistently than you would, you know, without without the product. The one other thing I was thinking about as I looked at the, the product on your website and also talked with you a couple of times and now what you just told me now is also that the ability to set the standards of the quality of the food is much better when you can design and plan it to excellence from the outset because often as you say it's a spreadsheet or it's a piece of paper this information in and nobody suddenly they can't find it it's not in that folder or somebody deleted it or that paper didn't never arrive uh, and i think that i guess that's also quite interesting i guess uh, from what i look from the website it's not only uh, independent operators and individual restaurants it's also chains that's adapting this tool because they can roll out thing in a different speed suddenly yeah, absolutely. We and we built when we originally built Mies, we actually, you know, some of our beta customers were large, large chains, um, in addition to sort of the, the fine dining restaurants, because, you know, one of the pain points that 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 I um, encountered when running, I was running this restaurant group called Orify Brands in New York. Um, um, you know, it's a chief operating officer there. And we, we would, um, I would help to create menus and also process and systems. And it would take us, you know, originally it would take us nine months, you know, to roll out a menu item across all the locations of a brand. Um, and you would have to sort of send out new materials, get rid of the old materials, you know, have go to each location and train individually on each process, you know, change out all the order guides and, you know, get new specs on all the things and train everybody where to store everything and, um, you know, make sure that like all the old recipes were gone. So they didn't make those on accident. And it was a lot of work. And then of course, updating all the systems that have these recipes, their back office systems and, and, and things like that. And, you know, now it used to take nine months to roll out a menu it literally takes a week, um, across the entire, like, you know, organization, uh, because everybody, you know, Mies is embedded in the operation. Everybody knows how to use it. And so really you can just distribute this content in real time. If everyone is updated, everybody sees the updated um you know recipes and so for a fast casual group or something like that it's it's really powerful because um you know whereas maybe 20 years ago um the like the marker of 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 quality and success was simply consistency right like can you create a consistent product but now like consumers are like a lot more educated they expect more and you can't just be consistent you have to be consistent and innovative you know, you have to, you have to be able to create new menu items all the time. Um, and they can't be cookie cutter. They can't be commoditized. They have to be good. Um, and, um, and you know, the, the whole premise of a lot of what I try to do, you know, in my, in my career was like, how do you scale really good food? And I think a, a lot of what the product helps to do is, is to do that. And it's also interesting, uh, as you know, the, the, the challenges we have in the world with supply chains and so on, that suddenly you could be standing with a challenge from one week to the other. There's a number of your items that needs to be changed, the ingredients in there, because first of all, maybe from a cost point of view, but maybe also just they can't arrive. It's not going to arrive, that ingredient. So we need to change it. We need to maybe take a menu item off, roll a new one in. And I guess also you have a lot of new people coming into your business right now in hospitality. Have you seen that has an impact as well when we, you know, think about the amount of new people that's been trained in businesses as they've been reopening? Has the tool helped them as well? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, it's it's, um, you know, the 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 cost to train and onboard onboard a new employee um, is I think is very often uh, underestimated. I think people, you know, clearly understand a lot more nowadays. But, um, you know, bringing bringing on a new employee is, is you know, costs a lot of money. You have to you have to train them on, you know, 
on your culture and your organization and where does everything live and on top of like, how do you do these things? Um, and, uh, you know, now with the way that the product is set up is, you know, because it's so easy to use, you can literally hand off only the things that they need to see. And in real time, as they, um, as they're learning these things, they can see and interact with this product to, to make sure they're learning the right thing. I'm always a big proponent of just in time information as opposed to just in case information, right? And typically training happens is happens as just in case, right? You go home, you read this long thing, you watch this long video, and then you go back and you hope that you remembered some of it, right? And I, I, I don't see that as, as, as really effective in, in absorbing information quickly, right? If I want to make, you know, a salsa verde, right? I want to see in real time, oh, I got it here. So I need to clean the parsley in the mint. Okay, here's how I'm going to grind the, the, the garlic. And oh, when I puree it, it should look like this. And as I'm doing it, seeing it, and I think the ability to, um, to make these, you know, these recipes far more explicit than implicit and creating like that, 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 that sort of ability for, for chefs to do that easily um, has, um, has really helped with training a lot. Uh, that's super interesting, uh, Josh. Uh, what about like technology? We go up in the helicopter in general because technology has really advanced and really there's a lot of it hitting the customer side during the pandemic. And there's been some in the employee side, but there's always been this unbalance of things about how digitalized a restaurant are in the front of house and the back of house. How do you see that plays out in the coming times? Because you know, is I guess technology is going to be a key thing really to automate these, you know, low value items or really important decision points you need to have as a leader in a business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, what I would say is, I think we're a long way away from robots cooking our food. That's for sure. Um, but uh, could can some of it get there? Maybe, you know, as a chef, it, it's a little bit sort of, you know, disheartening to, to think about like that, um, you know, but at the end of the day, yes, all of this is formulaic, the bricks level, the salt level, all those things can be, you know, we have to grab a peach and understand how sweet that peach is if we're making a mostarda um, to adjust the recipe, whereas I would assume that a robot that can read the bricks level at that time would in real time adjust the recipe and, and, and make it better. I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity there. What I would say is the, the food industry is only at the very, very beginning of the, the adoption life cycle of technology. So there's a lot more to come. And um, I think that the, you know, the, the, the price to value is going to take a long time to, you know, to, to really sort of like um, meet, right. Where like, where the, the idea of a restaurant that's able to afford to do that because first of all, you need to change your entire operation. Likely what you need to do is, you know, build from scratch if you're thinking about like automated, you know, processes. Um, so, you know, there's money in that already. So like th there's going to be, a, there's, a, there's a long time before I see that actually having a big impact on the industry. It will happen. I, my, I, I'm pretty sure that it will happen eventually. Um, I don't think it'll happen, you know, in, in my lifetime of, of the industry, but you know, maybe my, my kids or my kids, kids possibly. Um, what I'll say for me, I always believe that I like, I think Steve Jobs said this and it always resonated with me. Like the best te technology amplifies what we already do. Um, you know, there's, it not, it doesn't necessarily replace what we do now for sure. That's happened. Like, you know, like we were, like we said, like we know that AI is, 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 um, is, is going to do that. There's no, there's no question about it. Um, but cooking is a craft, right? So as it relates to the food business, you know, um, I can't speak to, um, you know, cashiers and things like that, things that are very rote, things that, um, that are very sort of, um, repetitive. Um, there's far more likelihood that those get, you know, replaced that said, you know, a big part of sort of what sets one, you know, business apart from the other is the experience. And so I, I don't know how you mitigate that, but you know, that's uh, something that needs to be addressed, obviously, but as it relates to like cooking, you know, um, I think that like, what our, our mission is, is just to amplify what these, you know, chefs and culinary professionals are already doing um, without sort of the, the, the advantage of like, how are we going to replace what they're doing? It's more just like, how do we make them better at the thing that they already do? Uh, so I'm hopeful that technology is going to continue to do that. Um, and that we're not necessarily always replacing people, but making those people um, more, um, efficient and more, well, more effective at the thing that they're doing, you know, over time. 
Yeah, and it's quite interesting. And I always say that, you know, text should save your time and money and as you call it, amplifying it. But actually should actually give them space to do what they are really hired for. Often these, you know, get them away from these things that's not really where they at super value. You know, where where do they spend, you know, their eighty percent of their time? Hopefully in the most valuable position they can be in, making the best impact for the guests and the if they're leader, the employees they are in responsible for. Um what what about, you know, like a product like this? We already touched a bit on it. Like, you know, we have this, you know, global staffing crisis in the industry. And it seems like there's even some places they talk about, like there's a, you know, a, an exodus of the industry, like people that would never, ever come back again. And, you know, technology has been, you know, talked about like a, a bit of a, a savior for, for that. Do you Have you seen that your platform had, made a difference for people here in in this period of the staffing crisis um have you heard any of your customers coming back said that they really took the pressure off us and yeah so um yes uh for sure i would say that there's there's and there's definitely a staffing crisis what i would say is i think a lot of what has happened is just illuminated what was already a big problem uh that needed to be solved independent of you know automation and things like that you know, uh, especially when it comes to like the food world, um, you know, standardizing, you know, uh, your product is something that, you know, most restaurants just didn't do. Um, and I think that there is a notion, um, and sometimes I get in trouble for saying this, that, 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 um, that there's a notion that like, you can't, um, document the way that something should be done because it's cooking and there's, and, and you just have to know and you have to feel and, that is true only to a certain extent, but it doesn't um, it doesn't mean that you can't be really, really prepared and as dialed in as possible for everything that can be controlled so that the only thing that the, that the team is really focusing on is the uncontrollables, right? Like the, the recipe can be dialed in really specifically. The process of how you make that recipe and when you make that recipe and why you re- make that recipe, that all can be dialed in. And then, yeah, then there's that sort of a last mile of, of execution where like people are important. Um, but, um, you know, I think the staffing crisis is really, my, my hope is it's really just sort of, you know, a, a new temperature check of like, Hey, it didn't work before. And so that means that like we lost a lot of, you know, people out of the industry. Um, but I think that they'll come back as restaurants, you know, the, the, as the right restaurants are setting the right example of like, yep, we need to take better care of our, of our employees. And, and it's a cultural shift, you know. I don't think that what this means is like now everything's going to be automated and it's going to be all robots. I think that it's going to force a culture shift because the culture in the in in the restaurant business, you know, just re- required one. You know, I come from the older school background of kitchens where everybody worked a hundred hours and you worked doubles, and you know there was no it was all shifts and you know, and um, and well, you know, I I still loved that. Um, but it is certainly not a way to have a life and have like quality of life or, you know, a life outside of the restaurant. And, you know, I think any incredible craftsman in any craft, chefs being one, artists being another, you know, comedians being another will tell you that like the best way to get better at like improving your craft is to experience life. Um, and I think that that was a part that's missing in the restaurant industry that, that, that will get back. I I'm, 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 uh, or will start to sort of, you know, become a new a, a new part of the culture so i'm i'm hopeful for that but i'm also you know a very optimistic person so yeah it's quite interesting because i talked with a couple of people and they said that we didn't need more restaurants before the pandemic we needed better restaurant in all aspects and that both comes to the employees the products the the service and uh, and those kind of people are, that runs business where they believe they are aiming for that standard they are, uh, they are, they, of course, they have challenges right now, but they still say it's, a, it will find a way right now, but it's not the easiest in the world. But they're, they're suffering, they're suffering from a cultural shift. They also say that there's some places that hasn't been treating their employees as well that they should have. Uh, and that has set a, you know, a, you know, a, a, a banner for how it is to work in hospitality. It was not always true, but it, unfortunately, that's where we ended 
in a way. And now we need to make the change to, to bring people back. And I, I, I really believe in the same things that you say as well. It's about setting a new standard and showing that actually we, we can be a place where you can have a life outside, uh, outside uh, work. It is, but and it is systemic. I think one thing I want to make clear is that, like, I think that there's this notion that, like, you know, restaurant owners have just been terrible to their employees. And you know, I owned restaurants for many years, and I can tell you, it is, you know, your back is against the wall all the time. You know, and you have to make decisions that impact, you know, all your team, and um, if the margins are so slim, and you know, there is a ceiling to how much you can charge for your products. It's one of the only industries where. Um, it doesn't matter, um, you know, the price point, right? There's a ceiling to how much you can charge for something, you know, based on our economics and so the, the cost of running that type of a business and to run that business really well, um, we should be charging a lot more for the food. Um, but, um, you know, we can't, at least not now, unless without like a, some sort of giant systemic change in the entire culture of, of, um, of why we would pay more for food and how we would be able to pay more for food. Um, because without it, you know, it is, it's just a very slim margin business and, um, and it's tough to, it's tough to, uh, to allow your employees to have, you know, that, that sort of, um, that runway because, um, everybody is just running on really, really tight margins. I, I, I am certain there are like ways to do it. Um, and it's risks and every business owner like knows that like, it's easy to tell them to take that risk and just to put everybody on salary and give them, you know, all the benefits. And that is clearly the right thing to do. But anyway, that's a business owner, you know, can, uh, can attest to like, it's a risk and their whole life is on that business. And, you know, and so it's, you know, it's, it, it's going to require like some collective effort on from the entire industry to make it work. Yeah. And I guess also, as you say, the perception of what a meal should cost because we've been, as consumer almost trained to that, you know, food is more like a commodity than an experience, special thing. You know, you have this ex expectation, what a cup of coffee costs and, and so on, as you say. And it's going to be interesting to see how that develops as well over the next coming years, because things will be expensive, more expensive. We can see it in the supermarket already and the energy bill and, and all that. And that's the, it goes the same way for, for the restaurant operators. How do you see then, like you know, you with your background in hospitality now in tech, but how do you see the the industry evolve over the next eighteen months? Because we are in, you know, for me, like in a very very special time in 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 the in history of our industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, I think that we're still, like I said, we're still in such early days that there's that the adoption curve still has a way to go you know, for us to see just to get the restaurant industry into, you know, status quo of what it should be in terms of technology adoption, right? If you're, if, re if you're referring to sort of like how I see, you know, you know, this industry of the next 18 months as it relates to technology. Um, but, um, you know, I, and I, I, I've said this many times, I think that, you know, the biggest change outside of technology is just the medium in which food is delivered to people. Right. And so we're already seeing delivery and ghost kitchens and those are clearly not going away. Um, I think that there'll be some level setting of like how that exists and um, in, and where sort of the, you know, the brands sort of, you know, end up. Um, but outside of, of, of those channels, you know, I think that there's going to be a disruption of institutional food, meaning like hospitals and country clubs and, you know, residential buildings like where the food typically isn't good. I think that because we need all these new avenues of, um, you know, of where we're going to sort of like, you know, um, generate revenue, I think that you're going to start to see really, really good quality food at all those places because there's enough, you know, talent that can actually do that. And they don't need to accept, you know, the commodity type things they might be getting at those, at those places. You know, I think, you know, maybe you see John George, you know, doing the food for hospitals. Who knows? You know, maybe you see Jose Andres doing the food for, you know, for hospitals and country clubs like, you know, that that and 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 by the way, I, I'm saying big names, but like all of the incredible sort of talent, you know, independently in each market. I think that there's so much opportunity there. Maybe you see like a Reem in San Francisco doing food at like different like, you know, there's there's lots of like there's so many talented chefs 
um, that I think there's a huge opportunity to like make sure that anywhere you go in the world, like if there's food being served, it could be good. But what you're saying, Joss, is also everything is up for disruption. Still, we are we're not even seeing the this this we're only seeing the start. That's what I wanted to say, uh, and I I agree with you. So you as a your business owner, Josh, you've been through you know the last eighteen months. Uh, is there any specific thing you have learned from that, um, and what are those learnings as a as a business owner in in a new type of business even? Then right? yeah, I mean, I you know I I shifted from you know from being a chef to be a restaurant owner to being like to running a large restaurant group to now running a technology company, and so there's so many learnings along the way, a lot of micro learnings and macro learnings. I would probably say this is maybe just germane to sort of the last you know three months or so of, of, of things that I've been going through as we, you know, we're raising a new round of capital and bringing on people and sort of trying to sort of make sure our team is operating at, at the highest levels. And um, I think there's there's typically like there are cliches that are cliches on per, for for a good reason. And one of them, and you tend to not really truly understand them until you know much later on uh, in hearing them. And I think one thing that has become so apparent to me is that people are not the most important part of the business. They are the business. Like they're literally, that is the business is like your, your people. Um, so, um, so they're not just, so I say they're not just the most important part. They literally are the business and that's how you succeed. And that's how you excel is getting incredible people, making sure that you're instilling your vision into the, into, um, into, uh, and values into what you do so that they can get behind it and making sure that they have, you know, the runway to just go and execute and be happy doing it. And if you can do that, you know, you can really do anything. Right. And I don't think I fully appreciated that, you know, um, and I'm sure I'll still continue to learn about it, but, um, but I always looked at businesses like you have to have a good product, or service, right? You, you have to have good people, right? And then you have to have good economics. And all of those are clearly true. But I think more and more today, I realized that like, uh, people are everything, right? Like if you have good people, and you can inspire them, and you can make sure that they're happy, and you can, you know, give them the runway to succeed, they will. Um, I, I think that they'll, they'll surprise you and your business will grow far more than you ever could have without without that sort of, you know, perspective. Yeah, and keeping that vibe of positivity and passion, I think that's the challenge as you you grow a business uh, as well, because that's one of my own reflection as well. A similar journey like you were, suddenly you standing there and thinking about, okay, the good people are leaving me while they're leaving me, and they're going quiet over there. So you find out actually that's your job to make sure that doesn't happen. You know, all the other things they need to take care of, you know, the cash flow. And of course you need to have an eye on it, but it's your job to make sure these people are in that energy level. And I think Danny Meyer talks about it as well in uh, setting the table where he talks about the sh- uh, the salt shaker kind of analogy. It's your job to set the table and put the salt shaker back in place all the time. And the salt shaker is the principle of your people and the vibe between your people. Hundred percent. Yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of first principle thinking, and every every team member at me is uh, the first thing they see is is our first principles because you know for me I believe like you can't have autonomous thought and and make decisions unless you everybody is sort of collectively you know believing in the same things and can make decisions and because of that they're able to make mistakes and I'm okay with it as long as they're you know abiding by our first principles. The number one being operational empathy, um, and that's that really is the bedrock of, of what we do. Um, but I, I always, I have this, um, theory and it might seem silly, but I've always had it. I've had it for, you know, years, ever since running, you know, my businesses is that, um, as a, as the, as the founder, as the owner, and I, and I, and I hope it trickles down, but it doesn't have to, is that everything is, you know, as it, as it relates to people, everything is my fault, right? Because I either didn't hire the right person for the right job, right? I didn't manage them well, or I didn't train them and give them the right resources, or I didn't give them, you know, I didn't inspire them enough or or was not clear enough about what the vision is for our company and why they should be excited about it. And if one of those four things is always the reason why, you know, people will make a mistake and it's almost never directly their fault. People are not bad people, right? And they might not be in the right role. They might not have the right tools to do what they need to do. Um, They might react to things, you know, um, they might be better with aggression than, you know, being soft and then you need to know that or, or vice versa. 
or they might just not know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and, and so that sort of, um, has given me a lot of solace, you know, to sort of, um, remove, um, people from the equation as it relates to like dealing with these problems. And it's never like, oh, they didn't do a good job. It's like, where, how was I complicit? What, what part did I, what, what part did I have in that? And that's, that served me really well, um, you know, over the, over the years of like understanding how to, you know, help manage a team, um, and keep everybody, um, you know, in a good spot. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Josh. I think there's a, there's a lots of people that will sit and nod and think, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I am on the same journey in a way. What about you? You also met some people on your journey that had, had an influence for you because you, you take some massive pivot and you just say it like I started as a chef, then I become a restaurant owner. Then I ran a, a huge uh, restaurant group and then now I run a tech company. You might have met some people on your journey that have actually made you be able to make these shifts. I guess there's some people has influence on you. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot. You know, it, it you know, oddly enough, I think the majority of the of the influence came early on with the chefs that I worked for, uh, with Greg Kuntz and Floyd Cardoz and even you know David Boulay. Like the 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 the, the, the lessons learned there that were ap- applicable to 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 life. You know, it's 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 pretty incredible how well sort of being a cook um translates into being a business owner and operator um so you know chef Greg Kuntz is, is incredible influence on i mean just in terms of like understanding you know um a, and devoting yourself to excellence and not you know and not letting any sort of little detail you know go uh unlooked and um and 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 floyd of just sort of understanding that like tech being a technician is just like imperative to being able to, you know, to execute, um, outside of the chefs that I work for. And there's lots of lessons I learned from them. You know, I, I read a lot of books. Um, and so I would, I would say that, um, you know, a lot of the inspiration, because I don't come from, I don't come from the startup world. I don't come from the tech world. I don't come from, you know, even the entrepreneurial world really. I come from my whole life. I've been, since I was 16, I was cooking in restaurants and that's all I ever did, you know, um, so a lot of it comes from books. And so, you know, people like Peter Drucker, like is a, is a big influence, like, you know, never do something so useless as, you know, like, like something doing, never do something efficiently that shouldn't be done at all. Right. Like that, things like that, that I, that I pick up from him or Peter Thiel, you know, um, you know, the, the idea of, you know, that, you know, if don't compete, right. Can create something that is at least 10 times better than anything that exists or create something that never existed before because the idea of competition is, um, is futile. And, um, so there's lots of little, you know, lessons that I learned from all the books that, that, that have helped along the way, you know, crossing the chasm and the innovator's dilemma and, um, playing bigger and, um, you know, zero to one with your teal and you and, and, um, you know, lean startup, there's, there's so many of those books that that they've had just an incredible influence on, on me in, in, in running a business. So, uh, which book would you give away nine out of 10 times lately? I think, um, especially because of all the disruption that happens, I love, um, play bigger. Have you, have you heard that one? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. um so I, I actually gift that book a lot. Um, because uh, I think especially now, um, it's just, uh, um, you know, it's, it, the, the premise of the book is, uh, is category creation. So, um, whereas, you know, something like crossing the chasm, which is also an incredible book, if you're going to be a, you know, you know, in a startup, just understanding sort of like, who are the, the early adopters and then who's the, you know, um, uh, getting through to the majority that, that, that would use your product. Um, but I, I, I found play bigger to be, um, just really, really helpful for me. Um, and understand like how to uh, create a new category and um, and why it's so important to tell you know the right story and 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 the infrastructure that you need to create around it and you know um, so that that book I, I actually gift a, a lot um, there's some cookbooks as well like I love uh, I'm a huge I love Apita Kishon's cookbook just visually it's incredible and it's also Apita Kishon is a is a restaurant in in Montreal and um, they they. I, uh, they created this incredible cookbook that visually is just so stunning and also has incredible recipes. Um, so I love that one. And, and, um, uh, and, and there's a bunch of other cookbooks that I love, but, you know, as it relates to like, you know, books that, that you know, that you would read, I think play bigger is one that I've, I've been gifting a lot lately. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll put uh, as many of these books in the, the show notes for people out there uh, as you're listening. So uh, how do you uh, show up pro every day? Because you are running, or have always been running fast moving businesses. So how do you actually show up so you're in the impact zone? So you are the best version of yourself? Oh my goodness. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I, I would answer that question differently, you know, nine months ago, uh, ago than I would now. I just had my second kid nine months ago. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, you know, like having two young children and starting a new business is uh, very challenging. You know, I basically just, I have no free time. And so where I used to, I had a very sort of dialed in routine every morning. Uh, and I still do some of this, but not, not all of it. Um, and you know you know obviously meditation and exercise and and then you know a number of different to breathe the things that i would do in the morning and i still still do some of them um i think that you know one thing that i always um try to um try to do with any sort of like habit to help me it, it, to help me you know in, in the day is like the best things are things that you can do consistently all the time not necessarily something that you can do like you know, doing a thousand push-ups, right, is great. But doing 50 push-ups every day for the rest of your life, that is easier, right? Because you have the win. And so I do things like that, right? So every single day I do 50 push-ups, I do three minutes of planks, I do 50 kettlebell squats. And no matter what, even if I don't get my exercise in for the day outside of that, I did that. I don't have to be anywhere, you know, I don't have to have any equipment to do it. If I don't have the kettlebell, I can just do a regular squat. And so that coupled with, um, I do, um, you know, time restricted feeding or people call it intermittent fasting. So I, I, I don't eat before noon and I don't eat after eight. Um, and if I'm going to have a late dinner, I just won't eat the entire day. Um, and so once, uh, once, uh, once a quarter, I'll do a three day fast. And then once a year I do a five day fast. And that I think has been a big help for me in a lot of ways, energy and, you know, just you know, the ability to, um, not have to think about like, what am I going to have for lunch? You know, um, because there's a lot of time that goes into that, you know? Um, so that, that's been very helpful for me. I actually have a lot more energy, you know, in, in, in the first part of the day by ironically by fasting. So, uh, but, uh, having two small kids, which I know all about myself is, uh, is an energy demanding, uh, business and then having another baby, which is your business, then, uh, that, that demands a lot of energy. So, uh, I know how how tough it is, but I love the way you talk about the compound impact of doing small things, which I'm always, always focusing on. It's about the 1% you do every day, then doing a thousand one day and then do, don't do anything for, for 14 days. It doesn't really give you the, the fuel you need to move forward. Um, my last question for you, uh, Josh, there's two questions left, but the, the last one where I actually give you a bit the stage and, you know, you can give your top three advice to, to leaders out there in the industry. What would your three advice be for, for leaders out there so they can go and accelerate their businesses in these times? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, uh, I think the most important thing you, you said it too, is just like the why I think, um, I always say like anybody, people always ask me like, okay, I want to start this business and what's the idea. And, you know, I think the foundation of anything that you do should be, okay, I have this unique belief of the world and I believe that I can create something that will help, you know, um, promulgate that belief, right? Like whatever, whatever the thing that is that you're going to do. And if you have a very clear vision um, and you can get people behind that vision, um, well then that's a machine, right? And then you just need to figure out, okay, how am I going to, monetize it. The monetizing for me, I, I believe, you know, becomes second, because if you have a vision and you have a vision that people can get behind, that means that people are going to, um, that more people can get behind it. And then you just need to figure out, okay, what is the, what is the revenue model from it? Um, and so, um, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big believer of, and I know there's, there's, there's synthetic businesses and, and then there's sort of organic ones and synthetic one is like, I see a gap in the market. And so I'm going to go build that thing. And that's cool. I think there's people that are really good at that. There's a lot of analytics and, and things like that. Um, and so if you can do that, that's great. My, my fear with, with, um, you know, with, with, with synthetic businesses is that at the end of the day, businesses get really, really hard, really, really quickly. And, um, the most important thing is, is grit and perseverance. And like, you have to like have a reason to get through all that hard stuff because it's much easier to just be like, 
screw it. I'm <laughs> like, this is too much, you know? And that's typically what happens is like, you have an idea and you kind of start working on it and like, oh, well, it turns out there's regulations or it turns out that like, I'm gonna have to get a thousand people to do this thing first or whatever that thing is, right? And if you aren't so maniacally, um, you know, like believing in this thing that you have to do it, um, probably shouldn't do it. Go find something else that you do, that you, that you do believe in. Uh, because if you do have that, then you can create a really incredible business. Um, so that would be my that would be my advice. Is just make sure you have something that you really um, uh, that you that you truly believe in, and you think that other people need to you know uh, need to be a part of. Yeah, and I guess also like lots of people have talked about. Danny Meyer was out recently to talk about how purpose drove him, and also what he thought with within the business that drove them through the, the crisis in a way that's been in the industry and you know that that's why they could persevere when it that that they get tough because the game gets tough it always does it goes in it goes in waves the the highs are not as many as uh, the lows you know often as i say yeah well the other thing i would say is um is um just tactically uh, and this really is in line with the same with the same thing but i'm a i'm a big proponent of the okr process um and you know everybody should probably read, like read measure what matters by 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 John Doerr, um, if you're going to start a business and um, um, and if you and and by the way the, the the OKR process is is really hard to get right and it takes time and effort right because you really have to distill down what is it that really matters that we are, that we're going to measure like what do we believe in what's our objective what's the big thing that we're going to do. And then what are, the, what are the, the results that really matter to get that, to, to achieve that? And it is in, in, in practice sounds very simple, but it's actually very hard because, um, because you have to be really like truthful to yourself and to your team about things that might be exciting to do, but don't fit into the, into the, into the vision. Um, but if you can really crystallize, a, a, um, you know, a powerful OKR process within your organization, um, it is one of the best ways, you know, to create focus and prioritization and, and, and see actual results, results o o over time. So, um, I'm a big proponent of the OKR process. I, I will say like, if you have a startup, I think that there is a time where it's too early to do an, to, to, to do an OKR process where you, where you, um, um, you may not even know, um, what the key results should be yet, right. You, you know, the objective, but you're still doing testing. You're still in that sort of like, you know, uh, value hacking, you know, phase of the business where OKRs might not actually be, um, you know, effective for you yet, and they might take away time. But once you do understand, you know, product market fit, and you understand the value that you're driving and who you're driving it for, then it's almost like a non-starter. I mean, like everybody should have it. Yeah, and it's a very agile tool, and especially for um, restaurants. Uh, and I advise a couple of CEOs we have worked with the OKR process actually to to manage uncertainty and suddenly you get, you know, that absolutely clarity a team with, because you actually, you involve people in making the plan. It's not just you coming say, here's the strategy. You create the strategy together with your people. And it's so, so uh, go and buy that book by Joe Dore. Yeah. It's an amazing book. I will totally agree. Um, where can people find out more about you and uh, mess? Where is the, the best place to go? Uh, well, yeah, getmes.com is is the website, and at getmes is the uh, is you can find us on Instagram there. Um, I am on Instagram, although I post maybe three times a year um, about my kids or my wife. But I'm at Josh L Sharkey um, on Instagram, uh, and I do sort of post about bees as well, so you can find me there. And that's it. Great, thank you so much for for coming to the show, uh, Josh. I send you and the the team and the family power and energy for the times ahead. Thank you. You as well, Michael. Thank you so much, Josh, for your great insights into how to use tech to improve your operation and your great reflection on leadership and personal development. I would recommend you to ask yourself, have I ensured that my people have the best tech tools in their hands to get the job done? To get further inspiration on how to improve profitability and productivity in your workforce, please tune in to episode number six, Only the Innovative Will Survive, with Joe Crisps, co-founder and MD at Trail. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at bizsimply.com on their social at BizSimply or BizSimplyHQ. 
You can also email them directly on advice at bisimply.com. Remember to download your copy of From Fragile to Agile, a white paper done in cooperation with Bisimply. Find it at bisimply.com on the resource tab via the link in the show notes. We have some great insights and solutions to improve your leadership game. A big thank you to Fina Charlton, the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us, subscribe to the newsletter, and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. From all of us here at Hospitality Maverick, we wish you a happy new year. And I'm Michael Thingser, and you've been listening to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. Be Maverick.